Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Real Estate for Charities webinar on buying and selling buildings in a challenging market. My name's Andrew Small. I'm a property partner in the charity and social business team at Russell Cook Solicitors, and my co-presenter this morning is Will Ray, who is a partner at Gerald E. Chartered Surveyors. So moving on to the first slide, which sets out the topics that we're going to be talking about today. Um, start with the sort of very easy and rhetorical question, why have things become so challenging? Um, it's all about uncertainty and COVID has really caused an unprecedented degree of uncertainty, both in terms of the extent of the effects and also the likely duration of them is still remains incredibly unclear but it's certainly got the potential to change what charities do and how they do it how they raise their money how many staff they need how where their staff are located and the amount and cost of the property that they will need in the future in in terms of charities activities you know short term at least could this be the end of face-to-face -face fundraising activities um events are going to be much much less lucrative where they even happen at all and for sectors such as schools and colleges their entire business model is up in the air and increasingly looks like they're going to be moving to a mixture of online and physical provision of courses with the announcement for example that cambridge university will be keeping all all lectures online for the whole of the 2021 academic year even for those charities who are looking at this as an opportunity to buy property and we'll be talking about that later there are going to be very real challenges particularly in terms of raising funds the banks are going to be very cautious both about who they lend to and how much they lend we're seeing loan to value ratios for properties um you know being affected quite considerably at the moment and charitable foundations who might support properties looking to acquire land are experiencing huge demand for their services one charitable foundation that we work with that supports other charities recently confirmed to us that it was essentially closed to new business and new request for funding until january structuring deals where you are going ahead is again going to be much more difficult at the moment for example where you're putting together a deal selling a property subject to planning permission historically the assumptions you could make about how long it might take to get planning and if there was an issue with planning how long an appeal might take are just not are just not stacking up at the moment and again we are going to be talking a bit later about deals that were done before lockdown where it's turned out that for either commercial reasons or reasons of timing the assumptions that were made before exchange are coming under a lot of stress and pressure at the moment even before all this happened a lot of charity trustees were engaging in sort of hard strategic thinking about property and how they used it how they're going to be using it in future most obviously in respect of offices where there was a considerable move towards hot desking and flexible working and the thought for example that if you had 100 staff your head office might only need 60 or 70 desks one of the consequences i think of making um office premises in particular covid secure is that hot you know hot desking is going to be moved right away from so but again there'll be a difficult strategic question about does that mean we keep the 70 desks and a third of the staff are always working at home or that we go back to needing bigger we go back to needing bigger offices and therefore potentially more expensive so just before handing over to Will to uh, give his comments on this sort of global view, just say a little bit about the London factor. You know, a discussion I've had with clients over many years is we know that London's the most expensive place to have our head office, but it's where our staff want to be working. It's the easiest place to get to from where they live. And particularly for charities that interact with government a lot, we feel we need to be there. Given that for the short to medium term, getting into london and getting around london and things that are open in london are not going to be anything like as easy or as available as what they were then that that london factor may end up may end up seeing that reversed and london to become less attractive in many respects will do you want to just say a few words before we then dive into the uh the the detailed topics yes thank you andrew and good morning everybody uh, my name is Will Ray. I'm a charter spare at Gerald Eve, and I'm specialising in, in advising on charity property. 
I think these are very challenging times for charities at the moment. Many of you will be balancing reduced income uh, through a drop in donations against increased expenditure, particularly some of those who are key service charities. Rishi Sunak announced on the 8th of April a £750 million coronavirus fund so that charities can continue their work. And this builds on previous announcements made by the government for businesses more generally, including VAT deferment schemes, furlough schemes, business rates holidays, SIBLs, grants and bounce back loans. And many are asking, is what the government doing for the charity sector enough, as some charities do face imminent collapse? The DCMS on the 6th of May reported that this support provided or announced by the government for charities to date has been insufficient, that the government has been too slow and that there's been a lack of clarity over how the £750 million fund would be distributed among, amongst charities. To demonstrate some of the impact on, of coronavirus on the sector, the Institute of Fundraising announced that 43% of charities have seen an increase in demand, with a 48% decline in voluntary income. Some 91% of those charities have reported cash flow interruptions. Now that survey was undertaken at the end of March, and we expect to see these numbers to have increased since. The Institute of Fundraising is also anticipating that the sector will lose four billion pounds between March and June. So I think it is essential for charities to be planning financially. The Charity Commission has released some useful guidance. Uh, the Coronavirus Guidance for the Charity Sector is, is, a, is, a, is a title, and we can send you the links uh, to some of these uh, references we make, we make throughout the webinar, um, uh, should you require. But this, the, the Charity Commission Guidance Pride provides useful advice for charities and states that uh, charities should be focusing on their cash flow, they should be looking at options for minimizing costs, protecting income, and to keep operations and finances under constant review. I think we think that you should also be considering your property as part of your financial planning. Are there commitments which you should be breaking? Are there projects which you should be looking to defer? And should you be looking to use your property to generate income or release capital for your charity in these current times? It is difficult to plan how much uh, property you need going forward. I think, as Andrew mentioned, there are complexities with workplaces. Uh, some are now able to reopen, but with strict financial, uh, strict social distancing measures in place. The Times reported yesterday that only one in ten companies are able to impose these strict social distancing measures. So, I think it will be interesting uh, going forward to see what occupational requirements do look like. In terms of timing, property is illiquid, it is slow at the best of times, and now with coronavirus, I think there's even more need to plan ahead and to make sufficient time to deal with your property. Just moving on to the next slide, please. So should I be putting my property on the market? Um, some of you out there may, may need to release capital for survival, um, but as trustees, you need to be asking yourselves, why are you looking to sell and are there alternative options open to you? Could you be repurposing your property? Could, could you be looking to borrow against it or maybe you should be looking to use it to generate much needed income at the moment? Or should you be waiting for sentiment to return to the markets? In making your decisions, um, you need to be balancing your financial requirements against your property strategy. Do you have a property strategy in place? And if you don't, then we strongly recommend that you put one in place. If you do have a strategy in place, what does this look like now? Has it been revised since pre-COVID times? And the survival of your charity may mean that you need to change or adapt your property strategy as you go forward, particularly if you need to release much needed capital to support your charity. I think the other question to ask yourselves is, uh, can you afford to do nothing with your property? I think this is more prominent with vacant property in that uh, there is a cost to keeping vacant property. You will still need to pay for utilities. There will be council tax and business rates liabilities. You will need to maintain and upkeep the property and there may be security considerations which you need to implement. 
I think if you have smaller properties such as flat, flats or houses, then these issues aren't quite so prominent. But if you have larger properties, maybe institutional properties such as care homes or schools which are falling vacant, then, then these costs will be very difficult to sustain going forward. And it may be in your interest to bring that property to the, to the market sooner rather than later and release yourself from this burden. In terms of market testing, is this an option open to you? Um, I think it's important to say if there's no real desire to follow through with a sale, then uh, by market testing, you could be exposing yourself to unnecessary professional fees, as well as potentially blighting the property going forward. More, more generally on timing, we are entering into uh, what, what some are terming the deepest recession on record. Um, and, and as surveyors, we don't necessar necessarily see the market changing for the better within the next three to six months. It is difficult to specify when the optimum time is to put your property on the market. You know, we usually do avoid uh, summer holidays, uh, but this year, I think, I think there will be some um, changes to that sentiment. Many of us won't be going away. Um, and we may start to see more property come forward in what, what otherwise would be traditionally quiet times. Um, if, if you don't have an urgent need to put your property on the market, then maybe you should be taking more time to make sure that it is fully prepared so that you can maximize your returns. If you are in urgent need of selling the property, then, then maybe you should be um, expediting that preparation process to bring that property forward at the present time. I'm going to pass you back now to Andrew. Thanks, Will. Um, as Will said, you know, the question of putting the property on the market, there's a mixture of long-term and short-term factors to be taken into account, a mixture of strategy and tactics. But for charity trustees, it should always be the strategy that comes first, that longer-term consideration of what is the mission of the charity, what's in the best interest of the charity, and how best to um, fulfill that at the moment. What we've seen a lot in the last few years is charities looking at sales of freehold buildings in order to free up capital to meet ever increasing costs and also as charities move to more flexible methods of service delivery, the, the big head office buildings or the big buildings where beneficiaries come to have not been so appropriate or useful as they were historically particularly where those buildings need a lot of capital or investment to bring them up to uh, bring them up to modern standards in respect of stat particularly in respect of repair and things like statutory compliance energy efficiency and disabled access and if that's the position you're in then that strategic imperative to proceed with a sale is still going to be there in the vast majority of cases and ultimately proceeding with that sale is going to remain the um, correct decision Therefore, the decision, as we're saying, will become whether to pre press ahead now or whether it whether to hold fire and sell later. And there will be that balancing act between um, getting you know getting the capital in now versus the increased costs of doing nothing. And as we all said, you know, can you afford to do nothing is a very real question. And there are ways of structuring so structuring sales, particularly when it's um, conditional on planning permission, if you're selling a property for development, that even if the upfront capital receipt now is not all it might be, then there are ways of capturing that future increase in value as the property recovers by building in um, overage or uplift provisions in the overage or uplift provisions into the sale these are provisions whereby if for example a developer is developing residential units on the sale on a site and then selling them on the overage provision will be a certain amount of sale returns above a certain level so there are ways of structuring sales to capture a future increase in value even in a difficult market such as this one moving on to the next slide which continues with a lot of you know there's similar themes but for any any charity contemplating the sale of a property there is a statutory overlay of process and procedure that needs to be followed and this process is set out in sections 117 to 121 of the charities act 2011 
there are some accompanying there's some accompanying statutory regulations as well and it, it tends to get referred to as the qualified surveyors report regime or the um or the qsr regime what that what the qsr regime sets out is that where trustees are disposing of property and that it's not really the topic of today's seminar but that disposal is very wide for this purpose it includes grants of leases surrenders of leases and easement and grants of easements as well as um sales of freeholds that before doing so the trustees need to get the advice from a qualified surveyor that the disposal is on the best terms that can reasonably be obtained and another key part of the advice from the qualified surveyor which is why it's important to get them involved early is advice on how the property should be marketed is the assumption from the regulations which for most certainly for most freehold sales will be an accurate assumption is that proper market testing to see who's out there and what they will pay is a, a key determinant of getting best value so linking that back to strategy and linking it back to particularly the you know trying to sell a building in the market at the moment advice i find myself giving a lot to clients these days is to make sure that the person doing your qualified surveyors report understands the strategic imperatives and understands the position of the charity if as if it is a slight you know if it is a sale driven by an imperative to release capital quickly in order to you know in order to meet costs and preserve core services then it's absolutely important that the qualified surveyor understands that because it will inform it will inform the advice about marketing possibly to truncate the marketing process and it will also inform the process that the surveyor will go through in terms of um, appraising and advising on the offers that are received if you need if you need your bird in the hand rather than waiting for some extra money that you might not get a few months down the road if your surveyor knows that then he can work within those constraints and can give appropriate advice so that you have complied with the qualified surveyors report regime but also complied with your statutory objectives and the duties on you as trustees if you are looking to sell a building in this current environment because you need some urgent you you need some urgent capital um taken out and as the as a frequent writer of qualified surveyors report wills i know you've got a few points that you uh, want to add on this yes thank you andrew I think the, the point about uh, your surveyor knowing your knowing your circumstances up front, uh, in, in our view, is essential to the selling process. Uh, understanding the reasons for sale, your objectives, your your timing aspirations, and your financial circumstances can can really help us as surveyors tailor our advice to to best suit your needs. In terms of qualified surveyors reports. Um, the, these are governed by the charities qualified surveyors reports regulations. And, and this does prescribe certain matters which we as surveyors need to address within these reports. And this includes factual information around location and description, but also covers things like uh, what is the condition and should you be undertaking any works to the property prior to a sale? It will address planning and in the same light, should you be looking at planning or maybe you should, should you be looking at some of your, your title matters? Um, the Qualified Surveyors Report will, will advise you on marketing strategy and if adver advertising is, is required, as well as advising you on the market value of the interest. Now, we undertake uh, Qualified Surveyors Reports as a two-stage process. So you would first receive your, what we term as a preliminary Qualified Surveyors Report up front, which will be addressing the matters which you need to unpick uh, and address prior to a sale and, and we're going to come on to some of these points a bit later on. Um, there will then be a, um, a period of advertising or, or market testing and there is a general requirement to advertise the interest in, in property and to achieve the best terms reasonably obtainable. The, the second part of the, the QSR regime will be the submission of the final Qualified Surveyors Report just before an exchange, which will summarise um, the marketing which has been undertaken and the steps which uh, the trustees and uh, their team and professional team have undertaken to, to market the property. And it will um, uh, formally recommend the terms to the trustees. I think it's important 
to say that um, there, there is a bit of a lack of guidance um, from the Charity Commission on, on what stage you should be commissioning your Charities Act report. Um, we, we are often approached at a very late stage, just before an exchange, and, and, and asked to effectively sanction or sign off a qualified surveyor's report um, for the terms which have been negotiated. I think there is a bit of a pitfall there. Um, if you undertake marketing yourselves um, uh, and you get to a stage where you need to sign off, you may find that the surveyor does not necessarily agree that best terms have been achieved or that appropriate marketing has been undertaken. So I think take advice at an early stage on what you should be doing to avoid any complications arising at a later date. Again, the Charity Commission has released some uh, recent guidance and this one is entitled Managing Financial Difficulties in Your Charity Caused by Coronavirus. Um, it does reiterate taking early advice up front it, it does state that if you do need to sell at the present time, then you may be you may be receiving less receipts than what you otherwise may do in more normal times, and that maybe you should be considering borrowing against your property as an alternative option. It also states that if you do need to sell, then then this may be in the charity's best interest to meet urgent needs or to help the charity to survive. But uh, importantly you must have a clear documented reasons to support uh, your, your decisions. I do recommend you read the guidance. Um, and again, if you can't find it, then please get in contact and we can, uh, we can talk you through it or point you, point you in the right direction. If we can just move on slides, please. So um, preparing your property ready for sale I just wanted to talk through some, some rather practical and, and to many, some of these may be rather obvious things which you should be doing to prepare your property to sell. I think the key message here on this slide is to, to ensure that you're, you're preparing your property so it's in its, its best possible state, not only to achieve uh, maximum interest and uh, best terms reasonably obtainable, but also to mitigate any complications arising at a later stage. I think it's fair to say that buyers, particularly in weaker markets, weaker markets, do undertake an increased level of due diligence. They may attach more conditions to their purchase than, than they otherwise would do. And if you take the time to investigate your property thoroughly before you go to the market, then you can, you can make sure that any of these unknown issues uh, can be addressed uh, prior to marketing uh, so that you can avoid any timing delays, potential price chips later on, or, or worst case, uh, purchasers walking away because of items arising in the contract stage. I think this, you know, some of these things uh, which you can be preparing in, include title matters, and I'll pass back to Andrew shortly in a moment, um, just, just to cover on, on that point. Um, I've got here uh, boundaries, are, are your boundaries in the right place? Uh, and I use this because it's a very recent example which we are dealing with. Um, I have a, we have a client with a 20-year-old property, and when we compared the boundaries on the ground to that shown on the land registry plan, it, it, it showed the red line boundary going straight through the buildings, uh, which is clearly in, incorrect and could cause delays later on. So before we go to the market, uh, our client is taking measures to address that issue. You will need uh, an energy performance certificate uh, for domestic or non-domestic properties. There are some exemptions, uh, some of which include uh, churches or places of uh, worship, uh, properties which are to be developed, um, some listed buildings and some temporary buildings. Uh, but in the main, um, energy performance certificate, certificates can be uh, uh, quite straightforward to, to commission and, and are relatively cost, uh, uh, cost efficient uh, compared to the rest of the selling process. But what about planning applications, um, uh, sorry, floor plans or, or measured surveys? I think we're increase, increasingly seeing measured surveys be made conditions of purchase. Um, 
and and it may be in your interests to commission a measured survey before you go to the market uh, which can be made available to potential purchasers therefore um, uh, ensuring that they they don't make a measured survey a, a, a condition of the of the purchase um, in high value areas um, small changes in square feet can have material impacts on um, prices and value so uh, having the facts straight up front uh, may seem obvious but can save you you pain later down the line in terms of planning do, do you know the permitted use of the property? Um, this may come up in the buyer's lo local searches, uh, which looks into um, planning history for the property. And, and just on that, um, we're increasingly advising clients, uh, particularly with uh, more complicated properties, to instigate local searches before going to the market so that you can understand what uh, some of the issues a purchaser may be facing at an early stage. Uh, just going back to planning, if 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 the use is not regularised, um, then it may be in your interests to uh, seek a planning application or maybe a certificate of lawful use to regularise that use before you take it forward. However, it may be the advice of your surveyor that uh, planning is relatively low risk. Um, and that it is unlikely to have an impact on uh, how the market perceives the property or the values or, or prices which, which you may receive uh, by way of offers. Um, again, your, your surveyor will, will investigate these matters um, as part of the qualified surveyor's report process. But what if you need uh, changes of use or larger uh, planning applications? Um, I think it's fair to say if you are looking at uh, large scale planning applications, maybe for, for redevelopment of, of property, then, then the costs of such should not be underestimated. Um, it, it is a very costly process and it can be time consuming and it can take uh, valuable resources away from the charity in managing the process. I think it's also important to say, and this is a point which is, which is often overlooked, is that uh, by undertaking a planning application, you are you are effectively speculating on what the eventual use of the property will be. And this may not necessarily accord with what the market wants to do. And in this respect, um, uh, you may not be able to recover uh, your expenses in a planning application, uh, let alone the time uh, and hassle which you've gone through in achieving that. In the alternative, you may be better advised to uh, to take the property to the market and invite interest on a subject of planning or unconditional basis and analysing the merits of each offers uh, as and when they arrive on the table. Um, if you are to accept a, uh, a subject of planning offer, then the owners will be on the, um, uh, the purchaser to uh, promote the planning application and, and fund that planning application. I think the final thing I wanted to say on this slide was around uh, the copyright of drawings and documents. Now, uh, often overlooked again, but if you are going through a major planning application, it will be accompanied by many drawings and many surveys. Um, for a purchaser to be able to implement the planning application, they will need to be able to have the copyright of the drawings so they can use them as their own. This can cause sticking points at the point of exchange or completion and again we recommend that at the outset you ensure that the you receive authority from the consultants before instructing them uh, that you can assign the copyright to a purchaser. Andrew over to you. Thanks Will. Um, so as Will said if you are thinking about a sale but you're not sure yet or you're you having taken advice you're holding fire for the moment there are lots of useful things that you can be doing to get the property ready for sale and to make the eventual conveyancing process as simple as it can be it's always a good idea to check the registration of the land and the ownership details um boundaries as well as said are often a, a key issue i I haven't had a red line running for a building recently, but what I do seem to have a lot of at the moment are 
properties where the there's a gap between the end of the title boundary and the start of the public highway so where we are sort of commissioning searches early to sort of help with the sale i'm one of the things i seem to be focusing a lot on at the moment is the highway search and looking for these uh potential gaps um making sure they're not ransom strips where a third party could potentially block access from the property and trying to um fill in those gaps before the property goes to the market um also making sure that the property is registered in the right name is very important um it's generally a more of an issue for unincorporated charities where as often as not changes of trustee haven't been reflected on title registers and there are things you can do about you can do about that such as applying to vest the property in the official custodian for charities before sale so that any of the so the charity trustees for the time being can sign can sign the documents um properties can be subject to restrictive covenants that um ostensibly prevent use for certain purposes somewhat um counterintuitively at the moment i'm selling a former charity shop building for a client where there is actually a restrictive covenant saying the property is not to be used for retail purposes so we are there are things you can do to deal with um difficult restrictive covenants in that case um which because the property had been used for retail for many years and no one with the benefit of the covenant had complained then the most economic um most economical solution in that sort of situation with a restrictive covenant is to take out insurance against it which will generally be for a fairly nominal premium in that situation um if the values if the value of the property is higher and the restrictive covenant is potentially more problematic there is a an option to apply to the land tribunal to have the covenant modified or discharged but that's a much more lengthy protracted and expensive process and will delay you know if you decide you have to go down that route having taken valuation advice and legal advice it will realistically um delay a sale for several months um another thing to be thought about when reviewing title and reviewing you know the physical boundaries of the property is are there adverse rights that um could affect the value of the property and a good example of that is a right of light if that you know it's if you're looking to sell a site particularly for development think about the adjoining properties think about where their windows and apertures are and think whether they will be able to say that in response to a planning application that i've got a right of light which your planning application is which the planning which a planning application is going to lead to a new building that blocks that right of light because then they can they can have very significant bargaining power and it can take very significant payments to get those rights of light released um there are things that can be done in that situation for example um applying for a light obstruction notice which stops the clock running on rights of light but again that's a, a fairly protracted and you know fairly protracted and expensive process and so only to be you know to be undertaken where necessary but the solutions to any of these issues it was, always needs to be proportionate and cost effective having regard to the value of the property and having regard to the potential difficulties it will cause to the sale so moving on to the next slide um, as we alluded to earlier a lot of deals um, that were done on over the last six months the commercial assumptions and the timing assumptions under which those deals were done in terms of an exchange of contracts are coming under a certain amount of coming under a certain amount of stress at the moment so if you consider the situation where you've exchanged contracts just before lockdown and now the buyer is being difficult and says he wants a longer completion date or a reduced price um or they'll pull out how should how how should you respond um the first things to say on that as it says on the slide you you know you won't be alone in this um deals particularly sales of development sites subject to planning by the time the property is sold planning is obtained and then the units are built and sold on it's going to be a process of many months or you know many months or sometimes years um you won't as i say you won't be alone in this and don't panic um as long as you got the sale process right and took got your qualified surveyors report before exchange of contracts the trustees are not going to be open to 
open to reasoned criticism for potentially having to vary a contract. Nobody saw this coming. This is a pretty much unprecedented event and inevitably deals are going to have to be, um, you know, deals are going to have to be looked at and potentially altered. Um, so your advisors will probably be aware of the proposal because they will have contact with the purchaser. But if they're not, get your invite, get your advisors back involved again as soon as possible. Because whilst a variation of a contract isn't a isn't a fresh disposal, it doesn't need a fresh qualified surveyor's report. The same criteria still need to be applied. Is the varied deal still in the best interest of the charity? Is it still on the best terms that can reasonably be obtained? Um, some some developers, some purchasers of land in this situation are going to be trying it on and pushing for too big a price chip or too big a time extension. And it's for your it's for your advisors to help you with those negotiations and get the deal back on track. Because in the vast majority of cases, if you've got the qualified surveyor's report process right and are dealing with the right counterparty. In the majority of cases, the right thing to do is going to be to keep the original deal on, keep the original deal on track at least for now. For example, I'm selling a property at the moment subject to planning, where the date for the purchasers to get a planning permission was the first of June, and we're, we're having a good, you know, they're being very open with us and having a good, honest conversation that they're not going to hit that deadline. Right um in part because of difficulties they've had commissioning professionals in the current environment and also difficulties with the local authority because local authorities are struggling to hit their usual deadlines for planning at the moment and so the calculation that we've made in that situation is as will said the market is going to be very sticky for the next few months and so the calculation we've taken is it's unlikely that marketing of the property will get a better result until october say and so what we've agreed in that case is that the deadline for them to get planning permission, we pushed it out till the 1st of October, because until that date, we're not going to realistically going to get a better deal. So the right thing to do is to give the, in that case is to give the purchaser more time to um, get the planning permission. And hopefully they will um, honor the existing contract, albeit we're going to need to agree a deed of variation. Will, I imagine you're dealing with this situation for clients as well at the moment. Yeah, I think um, if you were looking at this slide afresh, it, it, it does look like a very specific circumstance. But I've, I've certainly dealt with this issue over the last few weeks. Uh, you have, Andrew, and, and no doubt will many of you uh, listening in, um, either as part of your uh, charity or, or, or maybe personally. Um, I think I want to reiterate what you said, Andrew. You know, it is important if, if this issue does arise, it is important to take advice up front. Um, and, and if you do find yourself in this situation, you will need to balance your options. Um, yes, you can, you know, yes, you can serve it, serve notice to complete. And if they don't do so, you may be able to keep the deposit and, uh, and go back to the market. And I asked Andrew, uh, I just pointed this out to Andrew uh, before our webinar, and he said he could probably do a whole other webinar just on this particular subject. So it, it may sound straightforward, but, but I trust, trust me, it's not. Um, you know, if you do decide to take the property back or as part of your uh, balancing of options appraisal, you know, did you have strong underbidders in the first place? Are there still people knocking at the door who want to purchase it? Um, you know, what was the pricing like? Was it premium pricing or, or did you feel that you could have done better? Um, and you know, if you do take it back, how, how long is it going to take you to find another buyer? And, and don't forget, if you are taking back vacant property, then you're taking back uh, that burden, uh, which we discussed earlier, which, which otherwise could be passed on. You know, in the alternative, um, uh, as Andrew says, you, you might be better off uh, negotiating with the purchaser uh, to extend the completion date. We recently had a uh, had this scenario arise with a uh, purchase which was due to complete on the 1st of April, which had been agreed uh, prior to COVID. The purchaser contacted us and uh, their bank facilities had currently been uh, temporarily stopped, but they'd shown that they could release funds uh, in the summer. 
and the decision for us was whether to um, whether to entertain the request of the purchaser or to take it back to the market. The decision in the end was taken to extend completion by three months. Um, uh, the costs were borne uh, by the purchaser, and uh, the interest was charged on the on the late sum. So, in that respect, our client was was no was no worse off. But uh, we will soon be seeing in the next um, uh, four four to six weeks or so whether 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 we need to have the same conversations again. It's not going to be a one size fits all approach to this. Um, it, it may well trigger the Charities Act, um, and you should be taking advice at an early stage. Just just moving on slides. Um, we've talked about selling property, but but what if you still need property and, and want to buy? Um, they're, they're, I appreciate that this isn't going to apply to to all of you listening, but there are some circumstances where 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 this could apply. Now, some of you may be requiring additional space to support uh, an increase in, in, in key, key services over the last uh, few weeks because of the crisis, uh, and you need more accommodation for your beneficiaries. Um, some of you may have been looking to buy for some time, and the opportunity or that property or piece of land has only just come to the market. Um, you may be a tenant of a property. And you may have been trying to negotiate to purchase the freehold, or the freehold may become available to you. And should you be looking at that as part of your, your property strategy? Or maybe you're looking to relocate. Uh, maybe you want to be able to release uh, capital from your existing property because you're effectively looking to move to cheaper alternative premises. So there may be a number of reasons why uh, charities still need to buy property in the current market. I think, as we've said a number of times throughout this webinar, you do need to balance uh, your financial situation. Um, and, you know, is this a prudent use of charitable resources at the present time? You know, is, is now the right time to buy? Um, uh, therein lies the million dollar question alongside is now the right time to sell? I think it is fair to say market sentiment is relatively poor at the moment. Uh, there is talk of the deepest recession on record. Um, but I think if you have operational needs, then, then you may have no choice than to purchase property for your beneficiaries. Going forward, I think we are likely to see more distressed property coming to the market, and we anticipate seeing this coming forward at discounts to pre-COVID levels. This may create opportunities for charities out there, particularly uh, trusts or those who hold investment properties to add to their portfolio. But I think it's important to say that at the moment, we're still seeing a disconnect between uh, sellers having aspirations for pre-COVID uh, pricing levels and buyers looking for material discounts. In terms of funding, uh, as Andrew men mentioned earlier, um, it is a tough funding environment out there at the moment. Some of you may be fortunate enough to have cash resources. Others may need to borrow money. I think before you, you look at borrowing money, um, uh, sorry, I think before you look at purchasing property, it's important to assess whether you can borrow money uh, and that you can um, uh, fund uh, the, the repayments. Uh, before you do start incurring uh, surveyor's costs or solicitor's costs in, in purchasing property. Many banks um, have uh, more stringent lending criteria at the moment. Uh, many are only lending to existing clients and we are seeing uh, lower loan to value ratios at the moment uh, compared to pre-COVID times, uh, meaning that uh, charities will need to come up with uh, larger deposits to, to fund purchases. If you are looking to buy, then it's integral that you demonstrate that you are a uh, strong or a good purchaser. Do demonstrate that you have the funds in place, whether this is uh, through demonstrating that you have cash, maybe an agreement in principle with the bank. Show that you have your solicitors retained and ready to go and demonstrate that you can move quickly. 
if you are able to demonstrate that you are a good buyer or a strong buyer, then this may uh, give you preferential um, uh, discounts on the property potentially, or, or, or even stand you aside from any competing interest. So it's important to get, uh, get yourself lined up uh, in a good position to be able to show that you are a good purchaser. In terms of availability of property, and, and, and this is my final point really, um, it is sector specific. To be fair, we're not seeing a huge amount of property coming to the market at the present time, um, but following the announcements of um, estate agents being able to open last week, um, we are starting to see more property come forward, uh, not just uh, domestic property, but commercial property too. Um, and it was interesting to read that uh, a, an estate agents group announced the day after the lockdown measures were eased that they took over 200 telephone calls within the first hour. So there are signs yet um, that, that uh, the market is still moving and that sentiment is still there. Uh, but I think we have a, a little way to go at the moment. I'm going to pass back over to Andrew now. <coughs> Thanks, Will. Well, um, just to pick up on that point about market demand, certainly the first building that a client of mine has brought to the market, there were viewings on Thursday, the first day they could have done them. And, you know, I was involved that there were 11, there were 11 uh, viewings of the property and we've got a really strong offer and are hoping to get the property to exchange of contracts this week. So there will be, you know, the right property, you know, the right sort of stock that's, you know, prepared and ready for sale. Hopefully, you know, there are, you know, there are signs that the demand for property and activity levels will, you know, will start to come back. Um, in terms of what I want to say about this, I just to sort of is really revisiting the key overarching theme, which is strategy. Um, I wouldn't, you know, if purchasing property is what the trustees need to do and have decided is in the best interest of the charity then as will said if you've got the funding lined up and if you've presented yourself in a way to show that you're a good purchaser there may well be some uh, you know there may well be some great opportunities about out there um whether that's buying property for functional purposes or for um investment purposes and we'll go on to questions in a minute but i know one of the questions that has come through on the chat function so thank you for that is what should we you know should we be purchasing property for investment purposes rather than other types of investment and what i would say on that again it all comes down to strategy what the charity's objectives are and also what the advice is because whilst property has some great advantages as an investment class as Will has alluded to, um, one of its disadvantages is the lack of liquidity. And if you commit a slice of the charity's reserves to purchasing an investment property, it will hopefully generate you a good income stream. But you know there are going to be risks about tenant solvency in certain property classes at the moment. And if you need to get the capital out again, it will, can be a lengthy and protracted process. So investment property can be an answer but it is not the sort of the right you know it is not the sole answer or always going to be the right answer in every circumstance um so moving on then to the next slide we're doing again about questions so as i say that was the one of the questions that we've had through um another really interesting one so again thank you for that was um, if you're in the situation where you've got a, a long lease from a local authority, how to go about purchasing the freehold? And I mean, ten, you know, it comes again. The starting point is strategy. Is it in the best interests um, of the charity to acquire that freehold? Valuation of such an interest in property. Um, you know, and the factors to, you know, the, the different factors apply when valuing um, the value of a freehold reversion to the sitting tenant. That's a, you know, that's a particular valuation exercise and we'll, we'll, we'll can talk about that. Uh, but then, you know, so legally, you know, legally and it's entirely possible it would just be a sort of quotes, normal close quotes piece of conveyancing, but the, you know the extra piece that comes into that and again there's probably another webinar in it is um dealing with local authorities because they are a very particular type of organization 
you need to make sure you're dealing you know you're dealing with the right part of the local authority and just because you're talking to someone in planning don't assume they're talking to someone in property if you're an arts organization for example if the you know if your sort of officer on the sort of culture and media side thinks this is a great idea don't assume that they've spoken to the person in property and don't assume that the person in property is going to think it's a great idea so it is entirely doable and but it is a you know it is going to be a lengthy you know it is going to be a lengthy task that will probably take a fair bit of patience to um to get it done um will did you want to say anything about sort of dealing with local authorities and buying you know issues for tenants buying in reversions yeah i mean uh, probably not so much with, on the local authority point but um you know i think if you're in a position where you are looking to purchase the freehold interest and you are a tenant then um I get the, one of the first questions comes to mind is do do you do you have a feel for how much that might cost uh, or, or what the value of your or, of the landlord's interest may be um it is a relatively dark art but um you know the landlord would be uh looking at uh, the investment value of their uh, of their lease of the of, of your tenancy um as well as uh the reversionary interest which they will receive when your lease expires uh, plus potentially any marriage value which can be created through a merger of the two interests so it's important to understand if you can afford uh, uh to, to purchase the interest, um, but I think ultimately um, it, it's going to be uh, a case of, of, of contacting uh, the relevant person at the local authority and, and approaching them to see if you can uh, have some sensible discussions. Now it may be that uh, you can you have relationships with those at the local authority and you can have those conversations yourself. Um, but I think take take some advice up front on on, on what to say uh, and what not to say. Um, if you do want to be represented, then um, then of course this this is an option open for you, uh, either your solicitor or your surveyor. Um, and it, and and often these these do come down to negotiations. Um, uh, but it be to be seen whether the local authority would would want to treat with you. Um, just seeing another Thanks, question. Um, yep. come through Andrew and um, I think this probably uh, it probably falls to you more than me but I can give it a go if you like um, can a charity sell property at below market value if the buyer also has charitable objects i.e yeah. yes. uh, if they if they could be a social housing organization yeah I'll I'll take that one Will and then there's another one just come in which is great which I I think if you want to have a quick look at and um, that'll be one for you to lead on in a minute um so in terms of the question of can a charity sell a property at below market value to another charity um yes they can but it's not an unencumbered ability to do so um one of the exceptions um one of the exceptions from needing to comply with the charities act and needing to sell property for best value is if the sale is for less than market value and is to another charity and is also authorized by the trusts of the disposing charity um the guidance the charity commission guidance on that point has never been desperately clear you know has never been desperately clear but i think how i've always interpreted that i think most charity lawyers do is that um you, if you're a charity for the advancement of education you can't sell a property cheap you know to a charity for to a social care charity because there's not the overlap in charitable purposes there's not the overlap in charitable mission to be able to take advantage of that exception um you need to have overlapping objects and how i advise clients to look at this situation is if it's a charity you could make a grant of money to because they're doing related works to you then by making a property deal at an undervalue with them you're effectively making a grant of land and but it's important to get valuation advice as well so that you understand the value of any gift of land you're making to them by selling it an undervalue and you're able to in the same way as you should be assessing the return and the of any charitable funds that you apply in furtherance of your objects you can decide in later date was the gift of land worth it did it get in terms of fulfilling charitable purposes did it fulfill its objectives 
Will, do you want to pick up on the other question that's coming about price renegotiation? Uh, yes, thanks, uh, thanks, Andrew. Um, just to just to add to your point as as well, I think um, if you are looking to sell property at under value, then um, I, th I think I guess the obvious one to to think about will be whether um, uh, you can use the money which you could otherwise receive if selling at full value to to better further your objects. So just a, uh, something to balance that against. The other question that's come in is around um, uh, agreeing uh, a purchase prior to um, prior to lockdown. Um, you've agreed the price. Uh, you've not yet exchanged contracts, and there are still title and legal issues to resolve. Uh, is it a timely? Uh, is it timely to negotiate price? Um, I think it's not a straightforward answer. Um, I think. If you have agreed uh, a purchase prior to lockdown, then then one would think that there should be some um, uh, some movement on price. But uh, by raising this uh, with the sellers, uh, are you likely to prejudice the sale? You know, how important to you is this property? And um, you know, should you uh, should you be attempting to negotiate? Uh, if, if, if there's any opportunity that you could lose the property. Um, I think, you know, it, came, it comes a little bit back to what I was saying earlier. What was the sort of interest at the outset? Were you in a very competitive bidding environment? Uh, were you up against other parties? Did it go to tender? Did it go to second round of tender? You know, if it did, then I think if you're attempting to uh, reduce the price, then um, you, you, you could be risking your property. Uh, or the ability to purchase, but equally, I think it's reasonable to expect that that sentiment has changed between uh, pre-COVID levels and now. And um, one would argue that this should be reflected in the price. Um, it, it is quite a quite a difficult one to answer without knowing the the ins and outs of it. But um, I think take the advice. You know, if there are still title matters which which are to be resolved. Um, maybe if these aren't favourable to you or there are any nasty surprises, then you, know, you may be able to find something to, to hang your hat on to be able to negotiate. But, but again, uh, take the advice of, of, your, of your surveyor or, or your solicitor. Um, I think we're, we're quickly right. running out of time, but there's, well, there's one more on here, Andrew. Do you want to have a go at answering this one? Yeah. So. Can a qualified surveyor report be carried out by the company instructed to sell a property? Another another really good question. Thank you. And I I, I, I will start with the uh, the typical lawyer's answer of it depends or yes, but and then but then I will sort of flesh it out. Um, what the regulations say about the qualified surveyor is that they have to be acting exclusively. They have. To to be acting exclusively for the trustees and if there's a sole selling agent situation then um, you know there is nothing to stop as a matter of law to um, you know there's nothing to stop as a matter of law the selling agent to do the QSR the conversation where it gets a bit different and the conversation I sometimes have with clients in respect of you know particularly large transactions real sort of you know bet the company transactions really sort of you know transactions of very high value or where there is a risk of challenge from stakeholders who might not think selling a particular property is the right thing to do there is there is value in terms of governance and transparency for the qsr to be carried out by a surveyor other than the selling agents because it it shows that the trustees have gone through absolute best practice gold-plated process in terms of getting the price sense checked and that any criticism that you know the selling agents have signed off a slightly lower price or a cozy deal with one of their other clients in order to ensure in order to ensure their fee um is you know can you know that criticism can be rebutted you know that criticism can be rebutted straight away so the short answer to the question is yes the qsr can be carried out by the selling agents but for very low or high value or contentious transact potentially the contentious transactions there is a case for 
you know, there is a case for instructing someone independent to do it. Great. Well, that concludes right on time. We've kept to the hour, which is great, this webinar. Um, I hope those listening have found it use, useful and interesting. Um, you'll get some feedback forms and digital feedback forms. This is, you know, in terms of how we talk to our client, how we talk to people, talk to the sector. This is a slightly new world for us. Um, we'd be very happy, you know, we'd be very keen to do more sessions like this if it's been useful. If there are other topics you'd like, you know, you would like us to talk about, do please put that on the feedback forms. Um, you've got Will and my contact details if there are any further questions further to your specific situations, but we will stay online for another five or ten minutes. So, so if anyone wants to put another question through the chat but um through the chat button then please do um otherwise thank you very much thank you everybody Uh, we've had another question through, Will, about what would be the possible consequences of using a, a cosy QSR, which I think is the, um, which I think is a bit of a follow up to the last question. I mean, as I say, the, the qualified surveyor has to be acting exclusively for the charity trustees and they have to produce a report that combine, you know, that complies with the have to produce a report that complies with the qualified surveyors report regulations and it needs to conclude that the transaction is on the best terms you know the best terms that can reasonably be obtained and so i other than you know other you know as long as it complies with those you know those requirements those requirements it's fine and as i said in response to the last question it can be the selling agent who does the qsr but there may be times when it's important you know where it's useful that it's not yeah, just to add to that, um, not quite sure uh, what the term means, a cosy QSR, um, but uh, us as You're surveyors... you cosy to, wheel, I think, aren't you to do with? <laughs> us as surveyors having to uh, effectively sign off um, these these reports, we are um, putting our own liability on the line. Um, we are um, acting exclusively for the charity, otherwise the instruction would not be taken uh, at, at the outset. And we are governed by uh, the RICS, um, uh, which does place certain uh, ways of working and, and ethical codes upon us. So I think um, if, if charities are out there who are slightly concerned that they're not receiving the independent advice to, to sign off their transaction, then they should raise this, raise this immediately with their solicitors. Um, and it may be that you need to seek uh, uh, alternative advisors. Yeah, just to give one example of that, from when I was, it's a few years ago now that it was a that a charity in a rural location had instructed a firm of land agents, and when I got in touch with them to you know to make sure they had the QSR process in hand, the uh, the senior partner confessed that neither he nor anyone else there was a qualified surveyor, and that he'd he'd failed his finals thirty years previously, had set up this firm of land agents, and had had a thriving you know, and, ha and had a thriving career notwithstanding. So in certain areas, and also on the residential side, it can be important just to make sure that the selling agents do understand, uh, you know, it needs, you need to identify someone who's RICS qualified within the organisation to give the QSR. The Law Commission recommended re reforms to the, Q to the Section 117 procedure do sort of loosen the bounds of who can who can give the advice but it's important to note that unless and until we get a new charities bill those remain as recommendations and it's you know the qsr regime where it has to be someone who's rick's qualified um is what stands at the moment Right. So I think we will um, 
sign off at this point. Um, again, thank you all. Thank you for the thank you again to those who are still with us and um, do get in touch with any follow up, other follow up questions and any other feedback on the event. Thank you very much, Rob. Thank you for listening.